Hey friends, listen up. This is a message of hope. And if you're like me, you can't get enough of hope. In fact, you and I put so much stock in hope that when our hopes are dashed, we've got a tendency to be crushed. Well, the reason why hope is often dashed in our lives is because of the one that gave us the promise. And when somebody promises us and they can't come through, then our hopes are dashed, right? Well, God gives us promises and hope that cannot fail. Jesus came to this world to seek and to save those who are lost. And you might say, well, that doesn't bring much hope. Oh, my friends, yes, it does listen up. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. And so when you realize that without Jesus Christ in your life, you're living a life of void. Void meaning you're filling it with everything, but you still have no more hope. You're still the same person, but maybe now you're broke or maybe now you're disillusioned. Well, friends, listen, Jesus said it himself, no greater love does a man have than, he, than the man who lays down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that for you. So listen, let this message speak to you about the fact that he loved you so much that he went to the cross for you. And that resurrected Jesus that lives today is the Jesus who gives you hope that endures. It's a hope that will continue. So listen, let's grab our Bibles, let's get our notepads out and let's go to class as it were, learning about hope. Put your hope in him, he'll never let you down. word worthy is axios and it means this in the negative sense right here it is in the negative not worthy it means that there's nothing in this world that is weighty enough nothing substantial enough nothing that you can even detect as it were in the radar not even being in the same league somebody would say not deserving of attention in comparison what heaven is for us and we're in route to heaven this cancer, this diabetes, this broken marriage, this injured life, this broken mind is nothing compared to what's going to happen to you in heaven. God has got an awesome plan, and Christ is the answer on how to get there. It's not your works. It's not your efforts. It's all on him. As you turn to him and you cry out to him, oh, Lord, God, have mercy on me. He delights in that. He loves it. And we need to remember his perspective. He imparts that to us by the Holy Spirit. Don't let these things of this world bring us down. You know, come on, let's be honest. The things of this world have a, ten have a tendency to, you can almost hear sometimes the trials of life with a sucking kind of a drain noise. You know, it's like somebody pulled the plug in the tub and everything's going down. And look, if you don't get a perspective from the Bible on what's happening, you can get sucked up into depression. You can get pulled down into darkness. That's why when we need to love on one another, this ridiculous world has no authority, nor is it qualified to talk about the word love. God is love, the Bible says. And that is a love that is enduring. It's a, it's a, a yielding love and it's a defensive love. It's offensive love and it is a protective love. God loves. And it's a wonderful thing to see. And the, worthy, uh, the worthiness of heaven is something that we can only dream about, as it were. And he gives us those glimpses, by the way, of, a, of an earth that in some little tiny bit still bears resemblance of his goodness. And so here we pick it up. Part three of our message found at the latter end of verse 18, is that time is running out. And church, we need to be looking forward to the beginning. I love this part. It says in verse 18 that our sufferings now are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Man, you want to talk about pregnant truth scripture. It's right here. With the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory, talking about Heaven, this is a test, this is a quiz. Number one, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is where? Anybody know? He said, in you. Number two, 
Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is near you or around you. Interesting conversation, right? Jesus also said the kingdom of heaven is coming. Now you think about yourself for a moment. You and I in this world, spiritually speaking, are suspended between heaven and hell. You're in the place of what Tolkien would say, Middle Earth. (laughs) And there's two worlds pulling on you. One, pure love. The Puritans used to say, the Spirit of God is wooing you to God. The other side is pure death. All of the flesh, all of sin, all of the darkness, all of hell is pulling. And you're in the middle. You are the great prize in this grand scheme of what's taking place. Christ died on the cross for your sins, for mine personally. Listen, it wasn't a good man dying on the cross because a good man couldn't take in all of our own drama. You understand that? Well, I believe Jesus was a good man. Do you now? Then that's an insult to God. He wasn't a good man. He was the God man. He was born in Bethlehem, just like the prophets foretold. He was God come to earth in human skin. Read Isaiah chapter 7. Read Isaiah chapter 9. And Christ was born into this world. God's Messiah, the second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ. The eternal God who was at creation of the physical world. And he comes and he takes upon the form of you and I, a human. Not angels, by the way. Jesus did not die for angels. Isn't that amazing? I love that. He died for us. And he rose again from the dead to guarantee your salvation. All you need to do is to recognize what he says is true. He says that we're sinners. He says that he's the Savior. Repent of your sin. That means agree with him. Ek uh, homo legeo is to say the same word about sin that God says about it. And then you want to metanoia. You want to change your mind. So you don't have to get all weird religious about, oh, you know, what do I do? do I, uh, how, what do I do next? Do I do this? Do I kneel? Do I stand? Do I jump? What do I do? Jesus says, this is the work that God would have you to do. Everybody held their breath. What is it? Because you know, we're, our flesh is saying, you got to pick up 500 pounds. You got to give a million dollars. You got to walk 35,000 miles, right? Jesus says, believe on him whom God has sent. That was the answer. Trust in him. Put your faith in him. Lean upon him whom God has said. That's the work of God. But religion will muddy all that up and make it impossible. Don't do that. No, the fact of the matter is for us as believers, we look forward to the beginning. And it's quite awesome because uh, to experience the glory and to experience what we're seeing here is the word revealed, then we've got to embrace a word that... Uh, We kind of relate to, it's a little bit of a different use of the word here, but you like the book of Revelation, I love it, it's my favorite book. The book of Revelation is the book of Apocalypto, or Apocalypse, the unveiling. So let's read that again. With the glory which shall be unveiled or revealed or made known in us. The kingdom that is around us is the kingdom that is within us, and it's the kingdom to which we're going to, and it's, it's basically this It's God's governance over our lives. Nobody can control that. I talked to a family after first service. I'm not going to tell you what country they're from because they'll, I just, it doesn't help me to say what country. I'm going to be there soon, so I don't want them to not let me in through customs. (laughs) Um, But they live in a country where the, the government controls the sermons. The government controls the church. The government says what it can and cannot do. And the government says where they can and cannot go. And that's quite shocking to hear in the 21st century, isn't it? But it is what it is. No, for the believer, hallelujah, everybody, this world is not the consummation of our faith. This world is not the end of our journey. Our beginning actually really happens uh, when you and I enter into glory. There's a glory that we're going to go to. We talked about that last time together. We're in route. We talked about the word terminus. We're in route to the 
termination of our journey. And for the believer, the termination of our journey is simply the end of our opportunities as believers to be faithful to God. When that's done, it's home. It's the presence of God. And that is such a joyous thing. The word glory is that word doxa, to the praise of, to the honor of. So think about all the suffering. It's nothing in comparison to the glory that shall be revealed. Why is that? The praise, the honor, to the glory of, to the brightness and the beauty of God's glory and majesty. Be all glory, we would say, to the eternal pleasure and joy, here it is, of being in his presence. Look, that is both true in the future, but to exercise faith today, it's true for us right here, right now. How do you live today? You know, we have to be careful that as believers, we don't say, oh, you know, the, the days to come. And, you know, when that time comes, when that happens, uh, you know, we long for that moment. Yes, we long for that moment, but as believers, we live this life around us in the here and now from that position. That is our inheritance, but we represent the kingdom now, which is why the Bible calls us ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So very, very important. So listen, I want to repeat two verses from a few weeks ago. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus 2, 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Past tense. It's Jesus. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's impossible without the Holy Spirit controlling your life. Verse 13, one of my favorite verses of the entire Bible. Looking for, you got to circle the word looking because it means expecting, longing, yearning for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Who is it? Jesus Christ, verse 14, who gave himself for us that we might, that he might redeem us. What a God. What a God. Listen, in Judaism, you don't have this. You just have rules and regulations. In Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, Islam, all of its performance. Somebody's wrong. I'll submit to you this argument. The biblical argument is the most humbling. It is the most difficult to accept because it causes you and I to take the back seat and trust God that he'll take care of it all. The other one, oh yeah, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but we're going to add this. You just fall from grace, the Bible says in the book of Galatians. It says you're not a real believer. You're not true. You have fallen from grace. The moment you put works out in front. Oh, if I could just get accepted by God. You want to get accepted by God? You've got to be in Christ. Imagine being inserted, as it were, inside the righteousness of God, because that's exactly what it means. You are hidden by the blood of Jesus. But that is such an awesome supernatural reality that your life on the inside is transformed. You're made new. Colossians 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, is he your life? Then we also will appear with him in glory. That's a great verse. When he comes to pick us up, which is whom we're living for, we will be glorified. Lord, now please. Number two in our argument is verses 19 to 21. And that is... What are we waiting for when hope is increasing? It's true. Hope's increasing. Right now in this world, 21st century, right here, right now. This month, this week, today, hope is increasing. If you understand the scriptures. If you're waiting for God to do something next in your life, hope's increasing. If you're waiting for some uh, scriptures, some event, some, you're looking to the horizon, as it were, for God to... God, what's the next move? Hope is increasing. Look, here you are today. Not sure if you know this or not. Uh, most of you do. But today is Sunday. And Sunday is the first day of the week. A lot of people don't know that. Monday is the second day of the week. 
Sunday has always been the first day of the week. The disciples, for example, 2,000 years ago, on the first day of the week, they met together. It was Sunday. Even in Judaism, the Sabbath is Saturday. The next new day that starts the week, their, their Monday, so to speak, is Sunday. Right? You got that? Jews go to work on Sunday. To them, it's like our Monday. Our first day in this nation and in the Judeo-Christian Western world for the last 2,000 years, the first day of the week was dedicated to God because everything's dedicated to God. We're following the pattern of the early believers. First day of the week is Sunday. Second day of the week, we give that to the world. Are you hearing me? So what's very, very cool about this is the church worships the first day of the week. Look, I grew up in a, in a land far, far away in a distant galaxy. When, when I was young, I grew up in a country that you had to do everything on Friday and Saturday because on Sundays, everything was closed in honor of God. Did you know that? It wasn't until what, how many, maybe the last 40 years, 50 years? Everything was closed on Sundays in America. Everything. It was the first day of the week. That was our Judeo-Christian founding of our nation. It was always like that. And um, can you imagine today if I, if I were to um, imagine being a congressman in Washington, D.C., and you say, I'd like to propose a bill that... Um, we shut down everything on Sundays. Everything shut down. By order of the government, we shut down everything on Sundays. And people can either uh, play basketball, go fishing, hang out with their kids, go to church, not, whatever. But we're going de to dedicate this, this day. Can you imagine that? There'd be, a f there'd, there'd be riots. There'd be riots. Imagine if I just said this. There'd still be riots. We're just going to take a day off as a nation and strengthen our families. Dads are going to play uh, baseball with their kids and, and you know, the, they're going to go to the beach together, fly a kite, just unplug from the world one day a week. Can you imagine? People would get upset over that. What are you talking about, family? Who needs a family? They'll be... It's like some people get in a fight with an aunt. They just got to argue about everything. But could you imagine? I grew up in a world like that. That's the time warp I come from. But I got to tell you, When you're focusing your heart and your life on God, there's a, there's a hope that starts to increase in your life. It's just the way that it is. And in verse 19, we see this in nature. Nature is waiting. Look at verse 19. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creation. <laughs> Not the evolution, the creation. There's evidence of creation. There's no evidence of evolution. And I love to say that because it upsets people. So let me say it again. There's evidence... <laughs> of creation. There's no evidence of evolution. You need to know that. Oh, I've never heard that before. What about the fossils? You want to talk fossils? We'll have to talk about it some other time. But the fossils actually prove the opposite of what you're thinking about. The fossils scream creation. But that's for another day, but I hope it comes soon. That's a great conversation. Maybe next time. But the creation, the Bible says, is in a state of expectancy. It's eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. What does that mean? It means that nature itself is under the grip of sin's effect, and it's, it's waiting. The word in Greek means this is pretty awesome. It means that it's up on its, the tips of its toes, and we're supposed to be like that too, to look over. It means with expectation to be on the tips of your toes, to be looking in, like over a crowd. You ever done that? You're like, what? Can you see anything? That's how the believer is supposed to be. Now, I know we have to walk around normal in life. It's like, hey, how you doing? Nice to see you. This is how we, hey, glad you're here. But inside, we should be going, yeah, glad you're here. Is any signs of Jesus coming? Is, he in there? What, you, is God moving? You know, a truck honks, honks its horn. Is that it? Are we going up? No, it's just a truck horn. It's okay. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, there's this hope. Spiritually, we're to be living like that. Not silly, but expectant. Well, listen, I can tell you right now from personal experience that when I accepted Christ at the age of 19, 
in Southern California. There was a lot going on, like there always is a lot going on in life and in the world. And things didn't come together for me until I became a Christian. And then all the stuff of life that was so disappointing, going from one promise broken to the next promise broken. Listen, when that happens, it has a tendency to cause you to shut down from experiences and from relationships. But listen, here's the great news. To find out that you have the absolute hope in heaven because it's the hope of heaven, and that's Jesus Christ himself. The, the fact that Christ could come back at any time, listen, I have two overriding hopes. The fact that Christ could come back for me at any time keeps me ready and excited. And also the fact that if I die of old age or get hit by a truck, that comforts me because I know I'm going to heaven. Why? How can I be so sure? Because Christ has promised me. And here's the great thing. God cannot lie. Jesus cannot lie. Jesus himself said that all men are liars. Now, he didn't say that to insult us, but come on, you and I bragged about how big the fish was, right? You and I brag about, we had such a great time when it wasn't all that great. Well, listen, we have a tendency to tell lies because we are liars by nature because we're fallen by nature. And I don't say that to insult you and I sure don't say that to rob hope from you. I, I say it to do the opposite. Friend, he loves you. He died on the cross for you. And I wanna pray right now for you to invite hope into your life. Are you ready for this? Simply follow this. Dear Lord Jesus, I want you to be the hope of my life. I want you to be the one who takes control of me from top to bottom, that you would surround my life with your promises, which can never fail because you're the God who keeps his word. And when you said you'll never reject anyone who comes to you, well, Lord, I'm taking you up on that offer. And I confidently receive that now because you're good to me, because you're good to all those who seek your face. I give you my life. In exchange, you give me your righteousness according to your Bible. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, let us know. You can go to jackgibbs.com, reach out to us there. We'd love to know if you've prayed that prayer. Until next time, my friends, God bless you. You are watching Real Life with Jack Hibbs. Has your spiritual life stalled out? Do you find yourself on the side of the road, watching others drive past, unable to move forward because of fear, indifference, or maybe distraction? It's time to get your spiritual motor started and begin living a life of purpose, joy, and effortless faith. Ignite Your Life is a brand new book from gifted businessman and car enthusiast, Barry McGuire. With an energizing passion for living every day with fearless faith, Barry helps you conduct a spiritual tune-up to get you back on the track in the race of life. Ready to live a joy-filled, purpose-driven, God-honoring life? Order your copy of Ignite Your Life by making a gift of any amount to the ministry of real life. Get your copy by going to jackhibbs.com or by calling 877-777-2346. On your mark, get set, go. Life is full of fear, doubt, and worry. The more you listen to and see the world today, the easier it is to feel hopeless and helpless. Amidst the confusion, a voice of hope has emerged. The Real Life Network. Founded by Jack Hibbs, the Real Life Network is a free digital media platform, void of the noise of secular media that attack people of faith. Click on the QR code or sign up for free at reallifenetwork.com. Fast forward your faith. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effects. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who are searching for answers and truth. Will you stand with us in sharing this message in real and practical ways? 
we ask that you commit to support Real Life and the teachings of Jack Hibbs with a gift of your choosing. Simply go to jackhibbs.com. And there you can simply follow the instructions of how to give a one-time gift or a recurring gift. If you would prefer to call, our toll-free number is 877-777-2346. Again, that's 877-777-2346. And of course, you can write us. Our address is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.